All right, welcome back everyone. Um, uh, today's lecture is going to focus on um, uh, the Spanish Republic and in uh, the 1930s and also women from uh, the Republic, how they were mobilized uh, in defense of democratic rights, um, particularly during the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. We're going to be seeing, in other words, um, rep the media representations we're going to be seeing specifically are uh, propaganda pieces. Um, propaganda is a special kind of media. Um, it, we usually think of the term as propaganda in maybe our everyday lives having a negative connotation. Now, something is propaganda, it means it's somehow false, making false claims or otherwise. That's actually not a media studies definition a media studies definition of propaganda is any kind of media that is produced to um, influence public opinion about a given issue. So in other words, in this broad definition really includes anything from election campaign material, whether that's in TV, print ads on internet or otherwise, and even commercial advertisements could be understood to be in some cases propaganda. In fact, in the Spanish word for propaganda, propaganda, is actually quite um, yeah, close to the media studies definition. Any kind of flyer that's distributed on the street is also referred to as propaganda. So with that in mind, we're going to be seeing images of propaganda that was produced from both sides of the Spanish Civil War. Those who were in defense or in favor of democracy in an attempt to defend democracy, and also then on the opposite side of the war, the nationalist uh, forces that were trying to um, overthrow by military aggression, overthrow the democratic elected republic. In other words, we see that uh, those forces are referred to as the nationalist forces uh, or otherwise in, aligned with fascism. So the fascisms and fascist sides of the war that uh, are sympathizers that uh, attempted to overthrow the democracy. Um, we're going to be discussing then the media messages produced from both sides of the war that tried to mobilize or influence public opinion on, in defense of one side or the other. Okay, so in, we, I want to take a look at our PowerPoint here. Ooh, before I do, I want to share my desktop. There we go. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, so in other words, here in, um, in we begin our story uh, with some information, very brief overview of what was the Spanish Republic. Um, here we have a photograph, an iconic photograph um, uh, that's uh, of people celebrating uh, in La Puerta del Sol, which is a downtown plaza, central plaza in, in Madrid. Um, this is people celebrating the results of the 1931 election that went to a series of parties that identified as Republican parties. Republican has a very specific definition in the case of Spain. If you identify as a Republican, it means that you are in favor of any kind of state without a monarchy. In other words, any kind of a government with elections without a king. And so you can see that there were both left-wing and right-wing forces. This isn't a question of ideology per se, of right-wing or left-wing politics. It is a question of, of a model of the state. And it, we see, in other words, in 1931, the uh, people who supported the idea of um, a free, hosting free elections without censorship and so on, um, sweep these local elections and a new, a new constitution is drafted, a constitution of the Second Republic of Spain. The Second Republic would last from 1931 till it would collapse and then fall um, to fascist rule in 1939. We're speaking about a very brief period of democracy without a king, less than a decade. We see though here in this image, people are celebrating in the streets. Um, particularly at a time when um, uh, the, the monarchy had fallen out of popular support, had fallen out of favor for reasons we won't go into. Um, the, what were some of the constitutional, um, uh, the, the constitutional framework or elements of the constitutional framework of the Republic? I'd like to address that point and then also move on to some of the forms of legislation briefly that the Republic um, put forth. So we get a sense really of what this has to do, what this history has to do with the social context 
and particularly the representations of women we're going to be seeing. Okay, so first the constitutional framework of the Republic was one that we're familiar with um, if from the French model, uh, also has similarities with the United States uh, Constitution and the Bill of Rights because the United States case is also influenced by the French Republic and its model in the wake of the French Revolution. It means, in other words, that there are three branches of government with separation of powers and also a separation of church and state. Now, for the first time, this was a really significant uh, landmark moment in Spanish history because the Catholic Church had historically, for centuries, held significant political weight here. And for the first time then, these, these certain rights and privileges of the Catholic Church um, no longer are in held because they're considered to be uh, the state as a secular state or non-religious state. We also see then that there's freedom of the press and freedom of assembly, freedom of election for um, free elections to be held. Okay, now within this constitutional framework, which we're seemingly familiar with, there were a series of legislative reforms that were put forth. One of them, when the first one in, on the ticket was universal suffrage. So for the first time by 1931 into 1932, um, all women had a right to vote, or really all adults had a right to vote regardless of gender, um, in, without restriction. And there were, in a previous era, um, restrictions as to um, unmarried women of a certain age with uh, permission and so on could, by a male um, oversight, could, could vote, but those were not true universal suffrage. This puts forth, in other words, the, the, the un, um, unconditioned universal suffrage. We also see that, interestingly enough too, the first women uh, congresswomen, or ultimately deputy parliamentary women as they're referred to, um, were elected into office and before all women had a right to vote in this manner. It's really, uh, to think about that, and the, the exact election results about um, seats being held by um, women before, before women were fully granted the opportunity to vote is really quite remarkable too. Um, now we see then too, there are a series of legislative reforms that one might define as progressive in terms. One of these was a major educational reform. For the first time ever, boys and girls would be required to attend school through primary and secondary education. That is up to age of 13, 14 years. And before they made a decision whether or not to continue on with their studies and it was obligatory. What's interesting about this too is that not only was the curriculum established by the state, in other words, it was no longer established by the church or um, uh, the, uh, the Catholic church, um, in, it was also then an integrated co-ed education. In other words, for the first time, there was a public education uh, that was secular in which boys and girls would not be segregated by the genders be, to be able to uh, be um, is schooled boys usually towards a university track or a college or some kind of superior studies or business and professions and so on and women more on or girls on a domestic track. This is done away with with this or the attempt to do it away with this with this reform for the first time educational reform. We also see that contraceptions were uh, legalized at this time, this meant uh, the use of condoms or diaphragms, um, in, which could be found in pharmacies. In, and we also see that uh, controversially in 1938 in Catalonia, the region of Catalonia, an abortion law was passed and um, abortions were practiced or voluntary interruptions of pregnancy as are referred to um, in Spanish were practiced in, uh, under the auspices of the uh, healthcare system <clears throat> by trained professionals in order to protect those women who chose to interrupt a pregnancy. And we also then see that a divorce law was put forth, which allowed um, men and women to not just annul a marriage through the church, but also to um, separate legally um, and this was uh, something that was women's, uh, the first wave feminist movement and women's suffrage movement too, um, va was vying for, specifically because it, it, was a it was viewed as a way to allow women a kind of empowerment to leave an abusive relationship voluntarily and receive um, uh, 
uh, the legal protections and right to do so um, through divorce. In other words, it's viewed through a very different lens than today. We might see divorce as a question of, say, it simply didn't work out between a, a two couples consensually. It was seen as a right. So in other words, we see a series of reforms, among others, that were considered to be significantly uh, progressive uh, for their time, 1930s, um, and they were also considered to be controversial. We see in Joe Labani and Helen Graham's reading, for to, reading from this week that in part of the way in which Spanish society and its plurality either accepted these reforms or accepted a vision of future and accepted change or rejected it and reverted to a uh, form of um, conservatism or even um, a rejection of, of change is uh, rejection instead of accepting a kind of nostalgia for traditionalism and nostalgia for past is precisely the, the odds at which the, uh, the, the Spanish Civil War would play out. In other words, the friction in society about its modernization was precisely at issue in the Spanish Civil War. So we see then in 1936, uh, no, excuse me, begin, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We see that here, this is an image of Lady Liberty. This is the um, uh, image of the symbols of the Spanish Republic. Um, in other words, we see a figure of Lady, like Lady, Lady Liberty holding the scales for justice, fairness, equality. Um, she is dressed in the French model we see below liberty, equality, and brotherhood or fraternity, um, which is taken directly into Spanish from the French case, no? Eh, liberté, égalité, fraternité in French, no? Um, and we also then see the purple stripe of the Republican flag. In other words, the flag of those who would be in defense of democracy without a king. In, note in the background too, we have uh, all of the national symbols to the arts, and architecture, the humanities, these books, workers of the field, we see the haystack and the olive branch, as well as workers in the factories, the wheel and the anvil of the blacksmith industry. And in the background, we see curiously three different elements here. The most uh, modern form of land transportation at that time in the, the 1800s, um, prior to this time actually, in the 1800s, that sign of modernity and change was the rail. And then it was met by the turn of the century with the steam liner by uh, ocean. And then finally, travel by airplane in the teens and by the 20s had become commercial, um, was the uh, most is the advent of the latest technology. So we see, in other words, that the symbols of the Republic, too, are also forward-looking, in a way. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the elements from um, propaganda um, of the Republic. In 1936, we see that um, fascist troops, as is, re is referred to in the reading, um, attempt to overthrow the democratically elected republic. In other words, they, the military, um, the segment of the military defects and is joined by the Catholic Church uh, and also conservative segments of society um, who it rally behind an attempt to overthrow um, the democratically elected republic they would eventually prove successful in doing so. And that is the installation of the, the Franco dictatorship in 1939. We know the outcome of the war is ultimately democracy lost. That's part of the reason why we study the Spanish war because it is in, in essence a, a fascinating time that tells us that uh, democracy didn't have to win. And that's something that uh, we should keep in mind as part of a, uh, a memory of the past. In, why did the democracy not win in this case? Well, the, the artillery and the brutal force of the, um, uh, the, the military, of, um, uh, not only the nationalist troops, but their support um, by Mussolini in Italy and also uh, Nazi Germany, specifically Hitler, was far superior to the military technology of the Spanish Republican army and the, and the support it was receiving from the Soviet Union or from Mexico, which is also too far away to really be substantial in any way. Otherwise, the really, truly the, um, 
in uh, the world forces that we usually associate with the Allied forces in the uh, in World War II, which would be just after this. So World War II would break out in 1939. Um, in what ultimately those allied forces such as France, the UK, and of course much later would be Australia, the United States, and so on, that would remain neutral in the Spanish War. They did not want to get dragged into a war, um, and ultimately they were uh, in World War II. So they remained neutral in the Spanish War in this sense. Here we see uh, an example of a piece of Republican propaganda. It's issued here, we can see in the lower right hand corner by the municipal um, junta or delegate um, of the propaganda in Valencia. We see that it reads in Spanish, the Republican left on the front lines against international fascism. And we see the Spanish Republican flag bounding up the enemies here. And on the right, the president of the Republic, Athania, uh, who was known as an orator, which is why he has a finger in the air, um, supported by a soldier here. My question is, who are these figures to your left? There are four characters here rendered in a character-esque or caric caricature, really, um, cartoonish way. Who are they? On the left, you might see that this uh, swoopy hair and mustache man is an attempt to represent Hitler. This portly man who's wearing the, um, uh, the heart of, burning heart of Christ here is meant to be uh, Mussolini. And finally, if this is Germany, Italy, then this must be Japan. In other words, we see that this is an interpretation of Hirohito in Japan. The three major countries of fascist order that would ultimately be of imperialist fascist order that would be um, the Axis powers in World War II by 1939. They're represented in a cartoonish way as the enemy. And particularly in the case with the uh, Japanese Hirohito, we see that it's done so with racial undertones. This is very much something that's um, uh, that's common in the United States. If you look at Warner Brother cartoons from the 1940s during the war, where the Japanese are portrayed in, uh, in, with, in racist ways, ultimately, um, in, in, as the enemy. In other words, as a kind of um, simplification and, and exaggeration of tropes and types about the enemy uh, that today we recognize as racist. And of course, this is no exception here. Um, first, we say then below these three issue, these three characters, we have a minor character here, and he's dressed in a blue suit with a swastika, the eagle here. This is meant to be Franco. This is meant to be, in other words, the Spanish general who's supposed to be a minor figure in comparison to the real big three threats in the world. Right? So here we see this power dynamic between on the left, the cartoonish character of the enemy can be defeated by the strength of the Republic. Okay. All right. We see then too that um, women were mobilized into the ranks uh, in defense of the Republic and in defense of democratic rights uh, in different ways. And here we see an example of a, of a poster um, in defense of the militias uh, that would fight in favor of democracy and defense of democracy against fascism. It reads in Catalan language, the militias need you. Las milicias os necesitan, which means ultimately um, in Spanish would be las, milici las milicias os necesitan. It's written in Catalan language, the language of the region of Catalonia, right, with Barcelona as well. It's written, written in a local language, and that's part of the identity of the Republic too. The democracy of the Republic was a federal democracy that recognized that there are many languages and many cultures within this thing called Spain. That's the opposite of the fascist model. The fascist model was to centralize Spain under one rule, Castilian speaking, and it presumed that Spain was culturally homogenous, which is not the case. Now here we also see that this is uh, the woman Here's wearing a worker's smock with a rifle in the air. It's an empowered gesture. She's pointing right back at us like Uncle Sam would do from World War I. The US Army needs you for recruitment. In fact, that's taken directly or interpreted directly in the Spanish context from prior war recruitment propaganda, specifically Uncle Sam. 
But this is also curiously before Rosie the Riveter in World War II, where the war efforts of the woman rolling up her sleeve saying, we can do it, which I'm sure you've seen, um, is another example. This is before that her time. It was in between, right? Um, Rosie the Riveter and after Uncle Sam. Yeah, she's pointing directly back at us. In other words, the representations of women too would also um, put forth an idea of the ideology of the Republic and, and an attempt to mobilize women in defense of that, of the progressive rights um, gained under democracy. Okay. Now this, on the other hand, is an example of a fascist propaganda or nationalist propaganda. We see a worker soldier who his sleeves rolled up. He's vigorously sweeping up uh, the dirt or detritus on the floor here. Behind him is a Spanish flag. It would be this flag of the return to um, uh, the nationalist symbols of old, um, the red, yellow, red, not the Republic. And on the ground, we see all kinds of names and figures. In other words, social injustice here, the FAI, which is the anarchist association. So saying like anarchy, anarchists, um, separatists. Part of the fascist discourse was a fear that Spain, if it recognized that it had several nations, like the Catalan people, the Basque people, Galician peoples, that it would somehow break up or break apart into... Um, the separatist movements and so on. And that's, that was part of the, the, the discourse of fascism. Fascism had wanted Spain to be the Catalan speaking only and centralized in Madrid. As well as corrupt politicians and also Bolsheviks. We see the communist symbol here, this notion of Soviet Russia, the communist, socialist, the red, so-called reds is the enemy. And then also Freemasons with the Freemason symbol. This is a curious one. We're not going to address much in this class, but in the history of fascism um, in Spain, fascist discourse um, tended to blame the loss of its final colonies to the, of the empire um, on what it conceived as a Judeo conspiracy, Judeo Masonic conspiracy. In other words, it's a kind of anti-Semitism um, that places Spanish fascism in line with, say, Nazism. Um, in, in these manifestations here. There's no real truth to that, of course, that, that there were somehow secret societies of Masons, um, much less you know, predominantly Jewish, that were somehow responsible for the loss of Spain's final colonies in say the Spanish-American War of 1898. That's, there's no truth in that. But it formed part of the, of the um, obsession about Spain's loss of its empire in the fascist discourse in the fascist hist version of history. Let's take one more example of uh, in a fascist is, uh, propaganda before I ask you to analyze some on your own. So uh, here we see a, a, a haloed eagle. Um, this eagle in its halo is a direct reference to the royal seal of Ferdinand and Isabel the same king and queen who in 1492 sent Columbus on his voyage, um, his first voyage, and would end up um, in the New World. In other words, beginning a period of empire and colonization. In, we see then that that haloed eagle and the return to the symbols of empire forms part of the nostalgia of fascism for an imperial past that had been lost. That also is um, echoed in this statement down below. Una grande y libre, which means one great and free. It was believed in the fascist mentality that Spain was one. It was, in other words, um, united, culturally homogenous, inherently Christian historically. That's also not the case, as we know. Uh, there were Muslims, Jews, and Christians here historically um, in medieval times before their expulsion. Um, it, and also that even in more current context that Spain is somehow culturally homogenous, Castilian speaking first or only. 
also Spain is somehow free. Now, uh, no, excuse me, great, no? Um, Spain is great in the sense that the project of fascism was to return Spain to the grandeur of an, of an empire that had been lost, right? This notion of the colonies that had been lost. And then also free. Spain was not free, of course, and it wasn't under fascism, nor was it under, under dictatorship, but it was free of its enemies in a way. It was free of, of the so-called threat of its enemies, democracy. Okay. All right, and we also see here there's a Christian symbol. In other words, the unity again of church and state that the Republic um, had is successfully cleaved as a secular state. And so we see the unity of church and state again is why we refer to fascism in Spain as national Catholicism, the union of national history and ideology with a Catholic morality and interpretation of the, of the, um, the Holy See, the orthodoxy of the church. So with this in mind, we, see, we uh, get a sense of how the Republic at war, and particularly in 1937, as it's losing the Spanish Civil War, um, is interested in gaining international support for or recognition, awareness for the Spanish Civil War and the defense of democracy, defense of the Republic as an ideological project against fascism. And that's why ultimately, or that's the history of Guernica as we've, we've addressed in our previous lecture, the podcast, in that uh, Picasso is approached to be able to paint something for, um, to be on display in the pavilion of the World Expo in 1937 in Paris. And uh, the bombing of Guernica would be the substance of his uh, inspiration for this, uh, the representation for this. And we see ultimately that it's, it's question of innocence and also of civilian loss of life rests uh, almost exclusively on both the animals and the women in representation. The only male figure we can presume is the soldier with the broken or rather dismembered soldier on the ground. Um, and otherwise all of the other civilians are portrayed as mother um, or as an innocent bystander um, or victim here. Um, and this is on the same plane as the animals in the in, in the, within the, uh, the, the frame. Guernica was portrayed, or was actually, was displayed in the Republic Pavilion in 1937, alongside other photographs and, and so on to garner this public visibility for the war um, and for defensive democracy. And we certainly see that here. Here we see a photo project um, by Giuseppe Renau, uh, which is in, compares on the left um, Spanish traditionalist rural dress in the Castilian plains. This is with traditionalist dress from the century prior on the left with on the right, the new soldier woman um, of the Republic. And it says, in, emerging from a shell of superstition and, and misery, woman, in, is born from unending slavery, capable of taking an active part in the development of the future. And we see the largest word here in French for, of course, displayed in Paris, it's written in French, is la femme, no woman. We see that is the, what do you see in comparison then? What, what, what elements on the left of traditionalist woman of the Castilian Plains is meant to contrast on the right the, um, project, the project or image of a, a forward-looking um, or represented a woman, of a considered to be progressive woman of the times. Go ahead and take notes on that. On the left, we see that in, I'll just give a few features, there's a sense of weight, there's a sense of, of restriction um, in the, the heaviness of the garments, uh, but also very specifically too, um, in the dress itself, um, all of the jewelry and, and trinkets, which are Christian in nature, which have different crosses and so forth. Um, on the right-hand side, we see uh, a woman um, uh, with her mouth open, 
and her posture is one of assertiveness. She looks like she's taking a step forward with her, her hands almost behind her back. And she's wearing a worker's smock. She is dressed in a rather androgynous way. It was what men and women would wear um, without, regardless of gender, um, it, when they were mobilized into the ranks of the militias in defense of democracy, or whether they were um, also working in, in manual labor. Um, it portrays her literally with a voice. We see these contrasts then between one and the other, the traditionalist versus progressive. Uh, and this is precisely the project of how the, 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 uh, the Republic is producing images to influence public opinion about, the, about its defense or need to defend democracy. Okay, now something I wanna be clear about is that of course, Republican women weren't the only ones mobilized during the war. There were nationalist women mobilized and Republicans on both sides of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but they were, they were mobilized in very different ways. So for example, in, on the left, we see that there are anarchist women, women um, who, who were enemies to uh, um, you know, fascism, um, which is they were, because they were against military rule, they were against any form of, of state, um, any form of, in particular, violence, um, often. Um, we see, in other words, that women were involved in collectivizing and making communes or collectives um, that could um, seize factories and organize work based on self-decisions. And that's what we see here is the CNT, um, International um, Anarchist Association, which is, uh, had collectivized a hemp factory for twine and other material, right, um, and fiber, um, clothes, and so on. And they, they're um, women who are uh, making these productive decisions without any kind of leadership as a collective. On the right, we also see that nationalist women on the opposite side of the war are in sewing uniforms and um, for the nationalist soldiers, for the fascist troops. So these two sides are at odds with each other in the war. And we see that the empowered role of women collectively making decisions without any kind of leadership in the defense of republic or in defense of democracy or in, in anarchist organizations and so on is vastly different than the way in which women were mobilized as subordinates and uh, very specifically in gendered either caretaking roles or religious roles, roles at the service of the nation. And in this case, we see sewing uniforms as a, as a kind of like um, extension of a domestic um, a task, but taken into the public service, a very gendered one. These are two very different manners or different ways of mobilizing women in the war. And that's something we, we're going to continue to talk about in a future class. Oops, there we go. There we are. Okay, <clears throat> so I wanted to simply um, <clears throat> bring in some material for you to analyze now, now that we have this information to be able to crack these cultural codes in a way. Um, these images of the Republic and the Civil War um, in, tell us that, in, or show us in a way that in, um, uh, well, different realities, but among them that uh, women were very active in defense of democracy. There were women fighting on the front lines um, and also in commanding positions of the Spanish public Republican army until 1937. At that time, the Republic fell back on its um, original intention and, and withdrew women from the war, from the commanding positions in the, the military. So, our author is an expert in history and gender studies, Helen Graham. She says um, that we have to take a seat of precaution whenever we discuss the Republic, because although it was a progressive Republic, there was still a form of male patriarchy in it. So let's talk, let's discuss this. Okay, so in Republican Spain in the 30s, Women were politically mobilized as subordinates, she says. In the progressive and left press, 
while women were depicted entirely favorably in their conventional roles, that is as mothers or faithful wives as a traditionalist role, when new women were featured, that is congresswomen, parliamentary deputy women, right? political um, a functionary, in other words, people in the women in the public service or uh, civil servants, or later as milicianas, as militias, as uh, women militia uh, fighters, these new functions were always made compatible with domestic and family duties. It demonstrated then, says our author, the patriarchal continuity that underlied the new Republican order that cut across from the right to the radical left, the anarchist left or anti-parliamentary left. In other words, she, what she's getting at is that although there were two very different ideological projects for women, the project that considered itself to be progressive was still undergirded by um, predominantly male um, uh, forms of power and, and structure to society, a patriarchal order. In, I want to call your attention to this image on the left. It's a photograph. Um, it's by Gerda Taro. Um, it's titled Miliciana Republicana. Was a Republican militia woman is receiving um, instruction on how to, to fight on the street and, uh, and on a beach in Barcelona in August of 1936. How would you describe her? What do you notice about her in relationship to the title? First, describe what you see, what it is that you see, and then describe in how this relates to the quote. When you come back, take a look here. We see then that the pose of the woman is from a side angle. She is um, on the beach receiving instruction Note, um, her hair is tied back, uh, but she's wearing heels, uh, which is, of course, a sign of archetype femininity. But at the same time here, um, it's certainly not um, part of a, of a standard uh, nor a practical uh, a militia dress or even um, a uniform for any soldier, regardless of, of gender, of course. Um, and we see then that she is also packing a pistol not necessarily um, a larger firearm or a rifle as we saw in the last uh, instance. Um, it also then draws in from a cultural imaginary of the femme, the femme fatale, femme fatale, which is the, the, um, the dangerous woman that appears so many times uh, in 1930s film and even detective literature from the same time period. In other words, it's a really interesting manner in which, um, in a way, fiction and representations of women in noir fiction, whether film or literature, is informing the way in which this militia woman is photographed and vice versa. Fiction versus reality. There's a blurry line between the two, and they influence each other. Okay, okay, there we are. We see here too uh, in, uh, an iconic image by Horacio Ferrer. It is uh, in 1937. Um, the image of um, women who are uh, mobilized uh, against an air raid um, in. Uh, um, Arguelles neighborhood in Madrid. What do you see in the image? Take a few notes. We'll see the distribution of the women shows us that there are three generations here. There's an elderly woman to the back who is grasping her hands out of concern. There are three um, younger women who are the next generation, the middle generation, and they are mothers. Uh, and you know, one is consoling an infant, her mouth open. Another is um, concerned, trying to uh, dra uh, drag the hands of her, um, of her child um, you know, with her and for protection. And the third is shaking a fist in the sky, sort of cursing the, the planes as they, they fly over. And the suggestion is that she was breastfeeding and that this has been, um, again, a sort of like a, a, the, 
the quintessential maternal act of um, uh, of giving the body um, and, and nurturing substance, uh, sustenance. You no, know? um, but the, what's really curious about this too is that she her gesture of the arm in the air is one that parallels uh, uh, the sign of democracy. The fist in the air is one that is a Republican symbol. In other words, in defense of democracy, it's one of solidarity and mobilization. And yet um, her gesture too, with the fist in the air, upward looking, might also give us the sense um, that she is hopeful in a way, forward looking, as much as she's cursing the skies. Um, and in the same gesture, the exposed breast of this woman gives us a parallel to Lady Liberty, or even some of the iconic images of Delacroix, um, who is Lady Liberty leading the people um, in the, the image of um, a painting of Delacroix um, from the 1830s. Um, or even if we take a look below, we see that her fist in the air is paralleled by the child who is also crying, but with a shaking of fist in the air out of frustration. In other words, there is a suggestion here in that parallel that this is going to be an intergenerational struggle, that it will continue, that this will, the defense of democracy will, will continue from one generation to the next. Okay, <clears throat> take a moment and write down, taking a look at the caption and the image, take down a couple of um, observations about each image and explain in what ways are these um, mobilizing women? In what ways are they mobilizing an intended audience of women? Go ahead and take a moment. We see on the left that the image of the photo, what are you doing to prevent this, is a, a, what's the equivalent of a public service announcement today, trying to mobilize women to follow evacuation orders or sirens so as not to have uh, a military or other rescue personnel um, in, around or needed in a time of uh, war um, if, simply because people aren't following um, evacuation orders. And so we see that women are mobilized here in this image through the figure of woman, through the figure of the maternal uh, character of a suffering mother. And it's that channel of suffering that's portrayed uh, and also a caregiving role is one that interpolates us. It's one that gets to the, the viewer. Um, it, it's ultimately the intended audience and the conduit, so to speak, of the channel, the vehicle through which this is um, intended to mobilize its audience. I'll leave the one on the right up to you. Okay, now here's an example too. Uh, of a contrast between on the left Republican in defense of democracy and on the right nationalist or fascist propaganda. We see that there are similar gestures to maternity and that solidarity with your given cause, whether it's one ideological cause or the other, passes through um, indistinguishably um, this sense of maternity, motherhood, and caregiving. There are differences, though, between the nationalist or fascist ideal of maternity and caregiving and so on versus the Republican. In, we see on the left-hand side, the Republican war propaganda, the people of Madrid request laureates for the general who is um, in the, uh, the war defending Madrid. And we see this woman is dressed in a, in a worker's smock in blue upholding the, the baby, right? Who uh, bears a, an olive branch, which is a sign of peace or hopeful sign of peace. On the right, we see uh, dressed in white, notion of purity. Also the child has a cross, a red cross, a Christian symbol on it. Um, 
the notion of the mother who is upholding the child, and it says, a nationalist war propaganda in defense of mother and child, in defense of a better Spain. Of course, here we're talking about a traditionalist notion of family, and within that, woman is as mobilized as a secondary role to husbands. That's something we're going to see in the dictatorship. So there is a difference between the two, even though the role of maternity and solidarity tends to be the, the conduit or the vehicle through which they're expressed as a form of solidarity with either cause. This is ultimately what Helen Graham is getting at this undercutting the, these roles that, that hold in different interpretations, but structure one, one versus the other in both cases. Okay, moving to a, some of our last slides then, we can also see that the men of the Republican Civil War <clears throat> are curiously represented through this sort of this bond of solidarity, um, this masculine bond of solidarity in defense of, of democracy um, it, which is so typical from the time. It's what we refer to as a homosocial bond. It might appear to us as homosexual in character because there is physical contact and um, a sometimes even affection between men that is made permissible because it is um, in the service of the nation. It is seemingly in the service of, of the, in defense of, uh, the state or a greater cause or the republic and so forth. This is this notion of brotherhood that we were talking about before. In, we also then see that men are um, often still in, uh, portrayed in these archetype roles as saviors of women. That's very clearly this, this case of the, the uh, public service announcement for the norms of anti-gas in the case of a gas attack, um, in poisonous gas, mustard gas or otherwise, of how the civilian population has men in gas masks to be able to um, save them. And in fact, the way that this woman is portrayed here, her head thrown back, a smile on her face, um, is a, a rather sensual pose um, that tropes the idea of men as saviors, um, sort of like coming to the rescue of damsels in distress but ultimately that this is something that women would enjoy, right? And then we also see too that the oftentimes the way in which men are portrayed in this, this exaggeration of masculinity is, a, is through sort of the chiseled figures, the Adonis body of the hyper-masculine physique, um, it, both on the left, as we clearly see that in the way that the men are portrayed or in the, the savior role on the right. So, I'm going to leave today's slide with the outcome of the war in 1939. Franco, the youngest general, um, he of course, would, would come to the rise, the young, youngest surviving general of the nationalists, um, it would emerge as the dictator and military ruler under fascist rule of Spain. And this is uh, victory propaganda issued in 1939 from Franco, or rather from the nationalist cause that is instructing the Spanish population what the new social order will be under dictatorship, under military rule. So take a moment and observe how women are portrayed, how men are portrayed. How is the dictator himself portrayed or represented? Um, go ahead and take a few minutes to jot those things down, take notes on them, and we're going to revisit them next week. Next week's lecture, we'll begin by talking about dictatorship. Thanks very much, and I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I'll see you next week.